All right. So today I have Ibu Masood from Tara and Amber Atherton from Zyper. How's it going? Hello. Good. So today we're going to talk about fundraising. But before that, let's talk about your companies. So Iba, what do you do? So Craig, it's great to be here. I'm uh, Iba Masood. I'm the co-founder and CEO of uh, Tara AI. So we're building an uh, end-to-end uh, solution for product management. Um, so we help product managers, engineering managers uh, spec out um, their products, um, gain insight into their development lifecycle, and, uh, and essentially monitor progress um, within software development. Hello. So great to be here. Uh, <laughs> Zyper helps brands connect to their super fans to build community. So we work with a lot of the big Fortune 500s like a Kellogg's or a Nike to help them really identify who their top 1% of fans are and then bring them into a space to co-create product or to become brand ambassadors. Okay. And so both of you this year raised your Series A, but I think it'd be interesting to start from the beginning. So could you tell me your story of, uh, did, did either of you raise pre-YC? Yes, no. I did. Okay, so yeah, this will be good. So one and one. Okay, so how did you do it? Okay, so I, it was 2017, I was in London, started a company in 2017, and I raised uh, raised 1.2 seed in London um, from a, a VC in London and um, a lot of angels uh, involved in that, great angels involved in that round <laughs> too. Uh, and then uh, and then I applied to YC and got in then. Okay. And then you did YC. Yeah. And you just applied to YC, but you applied a couple of times, right? Yeah, I did. So I applied uh, twice um, and uh, it, it was it was with a, at the time it was a different uh, idea, different company, different even market segment. Like we were focusing on the Middle East. Okay. Um, so it was, uh, it was basically like a careers platform for fresh grads. And so entirely different company. Okay. And what did you get in with? Um, we got in with a careers platform for grads in the U.S., so okay. that was like the first, that was in 2015 okay. when we first got into YC. And uh, post YC for that, we raised roughly around 200K or so. Um, so it was... Uh, for and, that product specifically. Yes, for okay. that product specifically. And um, it was it was very difficult. Like the first 100K I remember was, um, it was it was a very difficult process to raise. Uh, Pre-YC, we had um, just gotten about 10K in a grant from MIT uh, because we were doing a research into GitHub repos. So we were looking into like programmers and their work on GitHub and just kind of analyzing the commits and how, um, how you know, we could find patterns essentially hmm. and also try to identify the best programmers out there based on their work in Git. And so that early research actually formed uh, the, th- the thesis and the infrastructure for Tara as it stands today. Oh, interesting. Uh, which so- uh, we, so Tara, we officially launched in uh, like, and not even like the website or the product, but just launched with the idea in 2017. Okay. And how did the pivot go with your investors? How did you go about communicating that? So our investors were very supportive. Uh, so when they heard about the market that we were trying to tackle and uh, the product that we were building, they were immediately like, um, oh, here's more money. So what happened was um, about uh, a fourth of our investors doubled down. And so uh, from that 200K, uh, when we pivoted, we raised uh, 2.8 million. Um, and so we had a 3 million called it a 3 million seed. Wow. Okay. Um, so what would you attribute that up round to? Uh, I mean, it was just uh, the the opportunity, the market segment, the, um, the, the early, early team that we had assembled, um, and then also the early traction that we were seeing from the um, early like ML models that we had applied, um, as well as uh, as well as early customer traction. So um, the seed was in 2018, the 3 million seed, that's when we announced it, but it had really been a work in progress for a while okay. before that. So you lumped all that money together and called it three million. Yeah, we did. Okay, gotcha. So now having raised both of you a series A, can you walk me through uh, the differences in the process related to it and how you communicated it to your investors, how long it took, all that stuff? Yeah. Um, So we did YC Winter 18 and uh, Forerunner Ventures led our seed um, pre-demo day and that was exciting. So we raised four million then and uh, we were just charging forward with the product like timing first to market and we'd started having conversations at the end of last year around just raising an a like we it was more rapid than i thought it was going to be okay. um 
And then I had a conversation with Aaron about the Series A batch and thought, this is probably a good idea. Aaron is a good, good guider. So I should do that. So then we joined the Series A batch in uh, January of this year. Uh, and that process was about, I think it was like two months that we were in mm-hmm. that batch. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, two month process, just like heads down, super focused on building out our pipeline and just aiming to close the round in short a time as possible. But, but walk me through the two months because, you know, a lot of people aren't fortunate enough to be a part of the Series A program, so. Yeah, yeah, I can't believe we got in. No, joking. Um, so, uh, well, we can get into IC, so yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, what was the process like? I mean, it was informal, but intense. So as with YC uh, or anybody who's going through the process of like getting, building something people want and getting to that product market fit, you have daily insane highs and lows. And I guess what was great was just going into it with a structure of, okay, let's fill out this Excel sheet. Let's know every single fund that we want to speak to. Let's work the process and get the timing right. I think that was super helpful in in kind of catalyzing how quickly we could close something. So it was, um, you know, the standard process of fundraising, of targeting the people that you know you want to work with that support like your vision, and then going through that cycle of having conversations, second conversations. Uh, I think something we did that was really good, though, was writing that investment memo. Mm-hmm. Um so what we did was uh, kind of do the VCs jobs for them mm-hmm. uh, and write, you know, a memo as to to why you should invest in us. And that uh, sort of went out, you know, with the deck after the first meeting. So um, that's a very chaotic answer to your question. Yeah. but the- So what was yours? Let, like, let's get really specific. Okay. What was my investment memo? Rough, rough terms. Uh, honestly... We looked at a lot of other memos that we could find out there. So like the YouTube memo, picked that up and uh, really kind of spoke to other VCs that I know about like the, the, you know, their favorite memos or like how they think about like putting a memo together and then use that as a foundation to structure our own memo uh, as to, you know, what is the point of Zyper? What problem are we solving? Obviously, like how big can it get? And, um, you know, kind of unpacking what the risks might be and why they weren't really risks in our eyes. Okay. And how deep were you going into the financials in the beginning up there? Um, I mean, not massively deep, to be honest. In the memo, we weren't. We were just giving high level, like this is our revenue so far and um, this is the the market we're going after and how much we expect to grow um, in the next kind of 12 months. But obviously, we then had a model to back that up that was – uh, significantly more in depth around the financials. Okay. And so yeah. Ibo, would, would you corroborate that? Is yours basically the same? Yeah. I mean, I think uh, for us, uh, and, and yeah, if you remember, Amber, like the, the, what, what happened during that time, it was, so what happened with us was um, we spent about uh, two weeks during the, during the program, just really trying to nail the pitch, make sure that we were talking about the product and the solution the right way. Um, you know, just being able to really segment out the story um, and tell it in a very concise but in a much more uh, in-depth manner as well. Uh, it, and so what happened was um, we spent about two weeks pre, uh, pre like during the program. And, and how I, I found out about the program was I contacted Aaron and I was like, Aaron, our seed investors want to just pull in and, and do a 5 million Series A. Um, and they're like, you don't have to go out, you don't have to raise, and it'll be done. Um, and he's like... Uh, Think about it. Like, you know, you, sh- you shouldn't rush into these things. And those seed investors can come into your Series A as well. And so what ended up happening was our uh, total uh, fundraise process to go from first coffee meeting to term sheet was nine days. <laughs> Which is insanely yeah, amazing. I mean, congratulations on that. that. Well, the thing is that our seed process was so incredibly painful that this was, um, it was, it was obviously very surprising. Um, but, uh, and you know, our closing process took longer that, that took about 60 days or so in terms of like getting the legal mm. process completed and, 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 you know, figuring out like, um, uh, who we're going to bring on board for that final 1 million, um, in the overall round. But, um, I think, you know, one of the things that I will say is, it what we really tried to do was run a thoughtful process and really focus on the partner and um, people versus the fund. And so we were. Under- I totally agree with that. By the way, like yeah. it's it's really about doing your research and finding the partners who've you know led rounds and other companies that you admire or that you know have 
the right profile for your company? Yeah. So what happened with us was we were under quite a lot of pressure um, during that time because we had offers on the table and there were people just kind of, you know, dining and di- dining us and really trying to get us to accept uh, their offer. And uh, and it got to a point where, you know, um, it was uh, like people were literally calling up uh, folks in, in, in our ops team to like book meetings <laughs> Uh, on on my calendar, and it it got fairly chaotic. Um, I would say during during that process of nine days, but there were t- you know my my co founder Sayed. Um, one of the things like he's um, I think he's someone who's really the yin to my yang, and for the most part, he was the one who was like you know let's really take our time and think through who do we want to work with um, that are you know essentially just uh, good people in terms of individuals um, have a strong understanding of our market and of our customer um, can speak with can be thoughtful because the product is fairly technical. And we're selling to a technical audience as well, um, and so having the ability to actually understand and and in, you know from the engineer's point of view, that was something that we were really looking for. Mm. And um, and I think what ended up happening in our case was we decided to work with a boutique fund, uh, so Aspect Ventures, who are now Accrue Capital, um, and and Teresa Go, Lauren Kalodney, um, Asad Asad Khalik, um, like. For us, it was really about the team and very specifically the board member that would be coming on, on, onto the team. I and also think you probably knew early on, like in other conversations you were having, like whether that person or that partner really understood what you were doing. Yeah. And I think looking back with hindsight, I wish I'd maybe kind of ended some of those conversations earlier mm-hmm. just with people that I was, you know, really trying to convince that this is why Zyper is amazing and this is why it's great when they were so not experts in this space. And, and so you were just attracted to their brand or something yeah, like that? Yeah, I was attracted to their brand name and, you know, it's, it's always very exciting when a, a great brand name like reaches out to you and is, is, is yeah. especially if they're being aggressive about wanting to get a meeting and then you take the meeting and then you realize, uh, actually, you don't really understand this this space. And um, I, I wish I'd, I'd kind of been more... Uh, you know, assertive with ending those conversations sooner and really like doubling down on like, do these people actually have my values? You know what? There's always somebody out there. And I think this is, there was, I mean, Ibba's process is amazing. Ours personally took about 60 days mm-hmm. to go through. And I was flying also back to London to meet other funds there. And we actually ended up raising oh, from really? a London fund. Yeah. So um, we we're meeting people out here. And so it was a, uh, yeah. And then there was holidays and it just always drags on longer than, well, for us, than you think. So it was that 60 day process and then longer to get the legals. But um, I, I'm glad that we went through that because we did find a great partner who, were me- and you, when you know they, you know, they immediately get the space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's just yeah, feels I mean, awesome. God, I have to say, they, uh, so um, I'll just give you one example, right? We were at the, um, so we did the, th- we did three uh, full partner meetings. So that's when um, all the partners at a fund ask you to come in and um, the partner that's sponsoring uh, the deal or is sponsoring the, uh, you as, as a founder um, is essentially the champion. And um, and they're really, they want you to come in and really present the story, the solution and uh, and the market and, you know, why this is going to be the next big thing to the full partnership. Uh, and, and, you know, so we had done three of those meetings and, and so we had offers on the table and what happened with, with Aspect was, um, they approached it from a very personal stance, which was to really get to know us as founders and really try to understand what makes us tick. And then also where this, you know, where this company could go. And so even during those nine days, I had the opportunity to speak with founders of portfolio companies at those, uh, mm-hmm. at those funds. Um, but the other thing, I, I just remember this when, we were um, at, at one of the final meetings, and they found they found out that um, I, I love bubble tea, and so they. Oh, had, I remember this. Yeah, yeah they, they sent you all this bubble tea. Yeah, they yeah. had they had like oh, an array the- of um, of of boba just on the table. Um, and as soon as say, then I walked into the the, the <laughs> final meeting where they had the where they had the term sheet, and so, okay. I mean, but yeah, that was, uh, that was a fun. That's a funny. Um, so included in those nine days, are you meeting them the first time? Because oftentimes people start months and months and months before like grabbing a coffee with someone. Yeah, first time. First time. So um, so from the first, uh, f- in, in terms of for um, those few funds very specifically that got to the final part of the process, we met them for the first. So, uh, I mean, you know, I don't know when you can start the timer, but it's really like the day that we met them 
from that date to to term sheet closing. And by the way, that's a term sheet is not when your round closes. A term sheet is actually, like, and a lot of founders don't realize, is that a, a term sheet it can be considered an LOI. It's really a letter of intent. Yeah, it's like we're in. Ex- exactly. Yeah. It's it's kind of like that first part of the process. Um, you can't even consider it an offer in some cases. So people renege on term sheets all the time. And and so when we got the term sheet, I wasn't celebrating whatsoever. Um, so I like I remember we got our first uh, yeah, one. Yeah, I agree. And then, Cash and bank celebrating. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Not happening. So getting the term sheet was just the first part of the process where, um, and you know, for us, like we're like, okay, we have a few offers on the table. Um, and actually, we ended up taking um, a lower offer um, only because one of the things I always tell founders, and I, I just think I personally believe that you shouldn't maximize for valuation. Because the thing is that if you maximize for valuation, um, then, uh, you know, it, incentives aren't necessarily aligned. And so what you really want to maximize for is, are we getting to work with the right people? Um, because it's- And also it's a long-term partnership, Exactly. Right? Like it really isn't just a quick thing. You you are in it together. Exactly. So- And, um, and you know, one of, um, one of the investors um, that we had literally put a blank term sheet. Hmm. So the idea was that we would put in the valuation. Um, and I mean, it's, it's, it's a tactic, right? And so, um, and so, you know, it's, uh, like I immediately, I saw that and it's like, okay, that's a tactic. Like, you know, you, yeah. you don't want to play these games. Like yeah. at the end of the day, you're building a long, like exactly long-term relationship. Yeah. And, and so, you know, for us, like we're, we're just like, okay, we're just, um, you know, we're just, what we want to do is just work with human beings. Yeah. And, um, and that's so- what I loved about like Talis who led our round. It was from the get go. I mean, I was doing conversations with them at like midnight out here because they were based in London. Yeah. Um, but you know, there you go. You persevere, you get that term yeah. sheet and the money. Um, and you do realize like when you do je- like click with someone and they have that great personality and that they are, they really, aren't pushing like weird games with you on uh, weird tactics. Um, but I also, I think this goes back to the founder pressure to build momentum and urgency in your process. How do you do that? So many founders ask me that as well as like, how do I create this optics, this sense of urgency? And it, it's dangerous, uh, you know, because you, you can be tempted to say, oh, well, we have this other timesheet, we have this other offer, blah, blah, blah. Uh, just don't ever do that because it's so small as a community exactly. and just be honest exactly. about I, it. I, I, can't, I, I can't agree more on, on that yeah. point. I think one of the things that happens is, um, you know, f- uh, founders tend to, like exactly like you said, right? Like they have a lot of pressure. And one of the things people try to do is they try to be, um, you know, slick about it when mm-hmm. you don't need to. Like the, the at the end of the day, you're whether whether your round takes nine days or nine months um it's really about just finding the right the right person and the right partner so that's what i want to jump in on so um i mean it's not that different from like just interviewing someone to work at your company right you kind of need a little bit of a culture fit so what are the questions you're asking what are the things you're looking for whether it's like body language or vibe or, or whatever it might be uh to signal to you that like okay this is working like i think i want to be work with them yeah, I mean, I, I think for us, it was really just how they handled um, some of the early customer calls. So, um, you know, like, were they even finding out things that we didn't know? Um, like, were they so in- insightful in their question and answer process that um, they were relaying back information to us that could potentially um, help in growing, you know, uh, growing the team size um, at that company in terms of platform usage? And, um, and so there was, you know, there was that piece. And then there was also what I was looking for in particular was, do they really understand, um, how we're trying to build the data layer? So one of the things with Tara is that, um, we integrate with, um, Jira, with GitHub. And so the idea is to go from spec to issue. So your issue tracking software, which resides in Jira, and then also go all the way to commit. So, um, where your version control and source control in terms of the actual code commits. And one of the things we were really looking for was, do they actually understand, um, how important integrations are going to be? Um, um, in, uh, in, in our play and, and also, um, the value that we're providing. And also, and one of the other pieces was everybody was saying this was category creation. Um, but, but we really wanted to work with someone that had done category creation before, um, in particular and understood what it took to march forward and, um, and specifically really try to own the category from the get go. So, um, so there were certain things that, you know, we were, we were looking for and, um, and, and I think 
you know, if, even if I look at it in hindsight, I think we were able to run a thoughtful process in those nine days. What I found really fascinating was post term sheet, as you go through the closing process and, you know, the level of documentation in your data room and what you need to have prepared and ready. And, and at that stage, it's really important to work with a, a good law firm. Um, so one of the things that, um, I mean, I honestly discounted was I was like, okay, you know, I, I think the most important thing is to find the right partner. And then the legal stuff, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's basically something that a, a good reputable law firm will be able to figure out. Turns out the amount of follow up that um, they they required that the legal firm required after, and uh, I mean it was just it, it was really like we didn't celebrate until the cash was in the bank. Yeah, and, which was and a good sixty days after signing mm-hmm. the term sheet. I think so, also some good advice we got was negotiate a cap with your law firm to do mm, the yes. legals yeah. uh, because it will go over and it will end up being 30 days or maybe even 60 days. Um, so I think that was a good bit of advice. I think some of the questions that I asked the fund in that in that process, and it's really important that you do ask questions back because you are going into relationships. So you don't just want to not ask anything about who the, who they are and what they care. Some early indicators, same as Iber, is like, okay, how do they handle the customer calls? And how are they coming up with feature suggestions for the product? Like, are they so... You can tell early on if they're obsessed with the product and what you're building because they will give you feature suggestions. And I would then follow up with the customer calls and say, how did it go? Like, what did they think? And so often there would be this kind of joyous enthusiasm, like, oh, they were so excited about the space. And so I think that's a very like early indicator like do they really care about the product and and ask questions back like what do you understand about it what do you think we should be building in it because then they're building a vested interest in the company from a very early stage Mm -hmm. which i think can help uh push the process along quicker um so definitely asking key questions like that and and related to that what about the people that you kind of should have said no to and kept taking meetings with like what what were the signals you saw there you're like I'm probably, they're probably going to say no anyway. I'm wasting my time. Or would you have still taken those meetings and gone all the way through with it? I, mm, it's tricky. I, you don't know, I think, sure. a lot of the time where something is going to lead. And, and I think that is the classic, uh, like the vagueness of VC, the sort of unwillingness to say yes or no. And just, you yeah. kind of can get lost in that like gray area for a while. And you are kind of hoping that something might happen. Um, and, I actually, that's probably a telling point is that funds can operate quickly. Like you can move fast with paperwork. Mm -hmm. Like it is a hot deal. It's very difficult to artificially create a hot deal. Like you, if you are a hot deal and you've got a great product, you've got great revenue and product market fit at this stage, funds will move quickly and they can give you a term sheet. However, I do think that one question I asked early on was, you know, what is your process? Mm -hmm. Like, tell me, like, how does this work for you? Because whilst they can move fast, they still, you know, they have to present to the part- partner meeting and um, being mindful that they 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 also almost are entrepreneurs themselves. Like they have to validate it to their LPs and they have to get buy-in. So working together on how to move that forward and really understanding from their perspective what it's going to take to get this signed off, I think was helpful for me. Yeah. And I think um, just to kind of, uh, pres- if we look at it as a process and we want to present an overview, the first meeting is usually the single partner meeting, which is the coffee meeting. And at that stage, and for some founders, it may happen with an associate or a senior associate or a principal. What you want to do is make sure that you're meeting with an investing partner. And so they would usually have general partner in their job title. <laughs> yes. Uh, very what simply. do you think about um, this whole question that gets asked so many times about whether you should take a meeting with uh, you know, a principal or associate, because I think they, it's important because they can be great advocates for you. Yes. And so, so I don't have a black and white answer to that because the thing is that at Aspect, we met with a senior associate. Um, and that's, that's how the, the and I mean, and it, it was still a short process in terms of like getting the deal move forward. So, um, I, I think the most important thing is to meet with senior associates that have influence. And how you can figure that out is really just go onto their LinkedIn and see how long have they been at the firm. Are they someone who's really an analyst, but you know, has the associate title because sometimes you can have inflated titles at VC firms. And, and so if they've been there for a few years and even better, they're sitting on a board, like let's say they're a board observer, mm-hmm. then you know that this is someone who has influence at the firm. Mm-hmm. And, and so that was just my very quick, uh, vet, um, to, to, you know, in terms of deciding. Yeah. Um, I mean, 
for us, it was just such a short process, but that, that would be the advice I would give. Now, if you look at the actual process, so the first, the first piece is the, the coffee meeting, right? And that's when you meet with the, ideally the GP. And sometimes it's a senior associate and you get pushed forward to the GP. Um, if the senior associate is serious enough, they will bring the GP into that coffee meeting. Uh, in our case, what happened was um, some of our early, uh, from, uh, from those three funds, um, one of them in the first meeting itself, pretty much they had like four people there. Um, and it ended up being a lunch meeting. So it can be a coffee meeting or a lunch meeting in terms of that first uh, first meeting. And then um, if that goes well enough, they'll pull you into a Monday or Tuesday full partner meeting. And um, and so let's say if you have lunch or coffee on a Wednesday or a Thursday, by Monday or Tuesday, you could be presenting to the full partnership. Mm -hmm. So what happened in our case was we had back-to-back uh, -back full partner meetings. Uh, it was on Monday and Tuesday. Um, and, and so that weekend was when we spent really uh, prepping the pitch. And um, and if the GP really wants you know you to present your best foot forward in terms in front of the full partner meeting, they will work through that weekend or mm -hmm. you know whatever that date period is to make sure that your presentation is as good as it. Can I think be. it's so important just to focus on that because you, as you're left as an entrepreneur in this gray area, like not getting really direct clear signals as to whether a fund wants to do this or not, it's being mindful that yes a fund, a partner will work on the Sunday or the Saturday to like yeah. move this deal forward and they will do that. And so, they'll do the customer calls. They'll do the reference calls 100%. as well. Um, they'll, you know, th they'll put the power of the partnership behind this so that um, so that they're able to do adequate and enough research on the company. Mm. And, and, you know, I think for us on the other piece was um, – uh, YC and the, and the Series A program really, you know, honed in on the fact that you should have your data rooms ready and prepped. So we did. Uh, and I think that was, I think that was also what set us as Series A companies apart from even other people that we're raising was we really had our documentation in order. That um, was, thank you so much, Aaron Harris. We definitely yeah. <laughs> got the data room together and it was very organized. Like week one, that was our goal. And I mean, it still took us 60 days to close yeah, even I mean, with it, the yeah, organized sure. data room. So, but good um, point. So maybe, uh, also, just want to say on the like transparency like being telling the funds that you're speaking to as you're managing this pipeline and you're having multiple conversations it is really difficult to juggle all of these things and and kind of calibrate at what speed different people are moving at so something we would say a lot is just okay we just, just want to be mindful about other people who are in this in the process like you really you want a yes or a no mm -hmm. and i think it's fine to push for that like you need to get an answer like do you want to do this or not and if you have multiple people saying yes then you're in the position of saying okay let me decide and what my values are and how i want to move this forward in this long-term partnership but um i think be assertive with asking for a yes or a no right like, and, yeah, you know, no, well, they're just trying to preserve optionality and like you're yeah. trying to get some clarity here. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, and another signal, I think, you know, if we can boil it down to signals is um, that the fund will work to like take like four or five hours of your day. Like they will literally. So in those nine days. Uh, I'd be, I'd be up by 4.15 AM. I'd start. Yeah. Like I, I would, cause like meetings sometimes would be in SF or they'd be yeah, in yeah, yeah. Uh, Menlo Park. Um, and during, so the, 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 two, uh, the two weeks prior, um, dur during series A program. And then for those nine days, I was pretty much full time on fundraising. So that um, is so important yeah. to note so, as well is that being able to be in a mindset where you are locked in, in on exactly. fundraising. And this is what's so great about when you're doing YC. It's like, what's your day goal? Does it fit your goal? Don't do it. Right. And that is the process that you need to be thinking of when you're fundraising. It's full focus on that as much as you can, because uh, that's how you're going to get to close in nine days or in our case, 60 days. <laughs> I, it's still pretty good. I, the thing that's not obvious um, in my experience, you know, interacting with founders is that it just takes up all the time anyway because it's, it's mm. in your head. So all of a sudden, like the meet, the coffee meeting is maybe 20 minutes and say you spend an hour getting there, an hour getting home, whatever. But then you're reading blog posts, you're talking to other founders, you're doing all this other stuff. So that's why you really have to time box it because it will just get into everything. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I will say we were grateful and lucky that even though the process, you know, it was nine days, but we did get to spend approximately, I want to say seven hours uh, approximately seven hours with each uh, partner. That's great. Um, so, and, and you know, and I think um, it's interesting, like, I feel like that's also almost become a gauge for us, even as we go through a hiring and recruiting process for candidates, we like to spend a good seven to eight hours. I feel like it's... it's yeah, I think that's a good gauge. Great. I will say that we actually had... Uh, 
conversations move pretty quickly to WhatsApp, like to, to mm, chat. Yeah. So I was already building like a lot of rapport, mm-hmm. like back and forth on WhatsApp and like, you know, keeping it top of mind and just, you know, that helped definitely with the uh, the speed. Um, and texting Aaron at like 11.30 p.m. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Aaron. Uh, it's so, you know, a friend of mine's going, run, rising his Series A at the moment and it's just so useful to have other founders around you who you can just rift with because – there's this whole new Lexus that you need to learn of how you are communicating, like what the process is, like, you know, what the optics are, everything. And just being able to have a sounding board. Like I definitely text Ibba like multiple times being like, oh my yeah, God, yeah. how do I do this? And um, you need to have that that space to just have a sounding board to talk things through. So like, I don't have a co-founder. So I think, um, you know, thanks for responding to my text. <laughs> <laughs> So um, one thing we wanted to talk about was the, what this was like being a female founder. So obviously, you've only done this one time. You haven't been a male in another life and reincarnated, but you know other founders who have raised Series A. So this is kind of interesting to talk about. Yeah. Um, in your experience, how do you feel like it differed for you personally? Yeah, I think from my personal experience, I mean, we were so lucky to, to have Forerunner, you know, female-founded VC to, to lead our seed. So I had the experience of, of what it was like to sit with, you know, um, partners, like female partners, and it be a very comfortable kind of open conversation. And I think uh, what I hear from like other female peers and, and in my own experience is that often you're walking into, you know, a boardroom partner meeting where there is not a lot of diverse representation and you therefore feel pressured to take on maybe, you know, more male characteristics, like just being more aggressive or um you know just did you feel pressure to wear a hoodie do you know what <laughs> big deep voice i just had an <laughs> outfit that i would wear like and i did this in my c as well because i don't want to think about this so i would wear actually i think i might have even worn this like trouser suit corporate streetwear is my is the yeah. look here mm. little trainer little trouser suit on and then um i do think it is you know that is signaling in a way so i didn't ever wear the hoodie because i was like you know, it's just not my personal brand. I'm not. I did the hoodie during our seed. So post YC, really? um, I was just constantly trying to look like a programmer. It's just, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's it's sad, honestly. And no, uh, but it's also that that is what the valley has been conditioned yeah. to see and interact with. And I think that the style of communication that is familiar and has you know pervaded the yeah, space doesn't it feel so good to be able to wear whatever you want like, oh that's, absolutely that, and I think yeah of course freedom. like yeah. you should be able to be yourself like absolutely. i think that was something that i had to learn and i had to grow up really yeah to like to to be able to just be myself like i i think th- you you know you 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 face so much pressure to act a certain way to be a certain way to look a certain way and and i think um you know and but then one of the things uh one of the things i've actually been uh been doing is uh listening to um, analyst calls for public companies. Oh, I love listening to earnings calls. And, and this earnings is my new favorite thing other than podcasts is just <laughs> so, straight up earnings calls. Yeah, and, and especially if you listen to um, earnings calls um, by like minority CEOs mm. or by, or by uh, female CEOs. And, um, and I think, you know, bottom line, like what, what, I, what I've, you know, had to kind of train myself to do is bottom line is that it's really going to be about the, the, the traction and, and the team that you put together mm-hmm. to like, um, to go after a problem. And, uh, and, and, and so, you know, so I think um, one of the things that I also think, you know, is even since we did YC, uh, things have changed since um since that time massively drastically mm-hmm. and and i think it's you're seeing you're definitely like we at least i mean for our series a we saw more representation um in terms of the team structure like so the the, the senior partner principal and analyst mm-hmm. um we we definitely saw more representation um in the funds that we were talking to and uh, and i think also people are more um uh, are more i would say they're more used to like listening to the fact that founders don't necessarily come from Ivy League backgrounds um, or are of a certain race, and uh, and I think you know or understand sports references. <laughs> so um, so I think uh, for you know for for me I was like okay I don't need to learn the lexicon behind American football like you know I'm someone who understands soccer <laughs> as it's, as is known here yeah yeah yeah, yeah yeah um and and so I think that was something that you know um I had to I, I had to learn but and you had you had way more to show too and the confidence behind that like and that that's what it is right is that you can't uh, there's nothing 
to lean on. You can't, I don't think you can use, you know, being female or minority as like a crutch. Like if you have great product and great traction, then you have a hot deal. And like any other kind of justification as to why you're not getting term sheet is you you can't really say that. Like you either have product market fit and a hot deal and and that's in, in a, you know, my opinion but i do think it is a full circle like there are and there are great organizations like always like pushing to have more female like partners and also more female lps like mm-hmm. it's not just mm-hmm. us going out there it's like there's not a lot of like female entrepreneurs who are walking into these vc offices anyway and that is a problem that we need to solve is that we need to bring that education and like positive role models earlier on into the education system. Amber, what, what do you think of this uh, notion? So I've been hearing uh, from a couple of female founders that um, one thing that, you know, that really um, that's been worrying them is that whenever they get introduced into a VC firm, um, the automatic assumption is that they would want to talk to a female partner. And so then they get introduced to the female partner who's actually only been at the firm or fund for in some cases, lesser time and and may not have as much as much influence as someone who's a much more senior partner. Have you have you heard of this? I, yes, I definitely hearing... I experienced this actually personally. Myself. Interesting. Okay. So uh but I will say that I think that funds are grappling with how to deal with this mm. in, you know, the most sensitive way. And... I think the way it needs to happen is that you know, founders should be able to talk to the partner at the fund that understands their industry and their business. Uh, definitely. Like that's, that's really, it's that simple. Yes. It's, it's you know, they shouldn't automatically assume that because, you know, this person is a female founder or a minority founder that they should talk to the female or the minority partner. It should really just be fundamentally about, um, about the business. Expertise in the sector. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And but, but, okay, so were all of your... Um, were they just warm intros for for both of the funds that intro that led your Series A? Yes, like, yes. Okay. For us, I was a quite cold intro. Really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was an intro. <laughs> it was an intro, but it wasn't a warm one. So um, it took a lot of uh, I took a lot of time to get to know them, and I think I actually underestimated how awesome they are early on because we had so much interest when we started raising out here like and it was just it was overwhelming yeah and uh i kind of kept it more on the back burner also because we were out here and not in europe sure. and then uh investing the time to you know get to know them more and more was um uh it was interesting but yeah it was it was more more cold than warm Okay, so, so <laughs> yeah, you are in control of that to a certain extent. You're like, I'm trying to meet this person who knows them, right? You know, you would think so, but I feel like in some cases, um, you know, with, with with some founders or some situations, it might be that, oh, you know, I'm finally getting to meet this firm. Yeah. And so you just yeah. kind of take whatever whatever meeting is, it comes your way and it may not be the, the, the right person. I actually, you know what? I think I made that mistake. I don't, I think mm. I definitely did that. There was, there was funds that I was excited about and I didn't really, I was just like, oh, great I'm getting in and as opposed to being like hold on I really need to speak to this person because they understand the community and SaaS companies uh so yes could have done a better job there but uh, but I do think that um you know there's a great like always statistic that 2009 410 companies who had female founders got VC funding whereas last 2019 2,700 companies got VC funding. So there is a massive, like, lead positive increase that mm-hmm. we should be talking about that there are more diverse founders and there are more diverse partners and therefore we're getting more funding. So I think in general, like, we are moving to a much more positive, like, balanced ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's why I love being out here because the default mentality is optimism. Mm. Like, oh, okay. 100%. And, and, and an agency too. Yes, and you can meet anyone, you know, Twitter, DM, sure. I think I had a pro- couple of partner meetings actually just from a Twitter DM. Yeah, I mean, if you make great stuff, people recognize you. That, so. I think that's such a great point. And that really is what it comes back to is like, if you make something great, make a great product, have great traction, like you're going to get the meetings. And don't go into a fundraising process too early because it will just kill your soul just wait until you have really built the great company and you know maybe you even want to be profitable it's a dirty word i know know. we're gonna change the subject now Uh, (laughs) (laughs) um i i do want to talk about kind of the psychology you have to get into to fundraise Um, yes so yeah one thing that we were talking about before the podcast was uh addressing like how big can it be type questions Mm. so how do you go about getting in the mindset to answer that 
I think having an executive coach was something I should have done earlier. And, uh, you know, in YC, uh, there's actually a company in our, in our batch, um, Torch, who do executive coaching. And uh, I got on that and we started focusing my sessions on on that. It's just like getting powered up, getting ready. And also you probably have these traits innately as a founder anyway, if you're going out there and you're like, pitching your business to customers all day. So it's really like leaning into that and just just having a coach who can help bring that out in you and you know maybe listening to that Goggins book like just getting yeah. like that <laughs> mentality of like winning is 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 great because I think that um you know m- maybe this is controversial to say but I feel like the appetite for risk uh for a lot of female founders to to really answer that question you know how big can this be is it's more realistic perhaps of like okay well we have product market fit the product's going to change a bit so realistically we're going to ipo here so there's more of a like there's a less aggressive approach i think to Mm -hmm. the answer of how big this can be than i think i've definitely seen some of my like male peers take where they're like well it's gonna be 20 billion dollars next year and um i think it's balancing that right like you want to be completely convincing and have of course, your own conviction and how big your company is going to be. You're not doing this for any other reason. Right. So, um, and you're not also a sociopath who's just lying to people. And, and you cannot be that yeah. either. You know, you don't have five term sheets. Like, just yeah. be real. Yeah, that's with a yourself. really bad thing to do. And it is. It's yeah. a. It's a balance of yes, you're not a sociopath psycho, but you also need to just really believe in yourself, mm-hmm. and that is so authentic when you see that in conversations when people like have true conviction in in that and you need to convince the person sitting on the other side of the table that they are like backing the right horse and you will win it's important so in addition to you know listening to the david goggins book or whatever <laughs> what are the things to not do to negative that might negatively affect your personal confidence i think um let's see so One, I mean, I think we even touched upon some of those things during this conversation, which was, um, you know, just be true to yourself. You don't have to make it seem like, um, you know, that like, like it's a hot deal. Like I've seen some founders do that. Um, and it's deceptive. And the thing is that deception only works to a certain extent. Um, like, like, you know, like you said, right? It's, it's the, the valley is a small place. And so what you want to do is be true to yourself because, and, and be true to the partner you're going to work with because you're, you're, that person is really becoming a part of your team and a part of your company. And, and in some cases, really, I would say even a part of your founding team, because if you're under 20 people when you're raising your, your series A, then, um, this partner is going to become a key part of, um, of even day to day operations. And, uh, and so I think that the, you know, some, uh, I would say probably some things that founders, um, negatively optimized for number one would be valuation. So I, I don't recommend optimizing for valuation. I think then you have to work up to that valuation. And, uh, and obviously, you know, we've seen, um, the nowadays, right? The, the challenges that are happening in the IPO market. So I think, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's very important to come together and like, and really come up with a valuation that is, um, optimistic but realistically optimistic um and there's a lot of data out there that you can use to make this decision right like it's a 3x multiple from your last round or whatever data points you're going to use and so it's it is a conversation right like you are you know you both have interests but you need to align them and make it a conversation and not a kind of aggressive territory marking (laughs) situation second second thing i would also say is that um investors and partners have been doing this for a long time they understand founder psychology, mentality. They really understand and know what pressure tactics could and should look like. And I think founders really need to like understand and be true to themselves in terms of um, building a company is a long-term game at the end of the day. And and so what that means is you want to ensure that you're finding the best partner for your company or your business and really take the fund out of the equation. Um, you know, we had instances where I remember one of the funds was introducing us to like celebrities uh, where it's like, oh, you know, this person sits on this board. They're so incredibly influential. Imagine what they can do for your business. You mean your literal company. celebrities or Silicon well, Valley celebrities in the business celebrity. world? Okay. Like, yeah. Like, okay. I mean, not like, you know, not actually. Right. Okay. Well, whatever, I mean, but, just like, to I be mean, clear, just, like that happens too. So. That yeah. happens yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. but I, I think they really, you know, they read the room. So they're like, okay, that's what these founders would appreciate. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's that's what happened. And, and you know, I'm just 
we are, I'm so glad we really didn't get pulled into the, you know, glitz and glam of, of the whole thing, if we can even call it that. But, um, but I, I think just being, staying true to yourself and, um, really, you know, being heads down. And I think that's, that's what's really key here. What, what we, do you think is the, you know, you say look for partners who like share your long term view. It's long term building a company, but what, like, how are you getting the evidence of that? Okay, so what I did was I asked pointed questions to the founders. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I honestly, I'm really grateful that those founders were truthful because I think you mean some portfolio of, companies. Yes, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. of their portfolio companies. So I, I specifically asked pointed questions. I really tried to get to the bottom of things. And, and you know, what you can do is you can set up a question like, in, in it, it's um it's it's fascinating, right? You can really set up a Q and A process where you're really getting to the to to, uh, to where the rubber meets the road, hmm. and and so for for me, like that's what what I wanted to do, and I think um it's it's even made I would probably even say made me a better interviewer, yeah, uh, even in our recruiting process and our candidate recruiting process, um and uh, and so that I think and 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 you could like I got to a point where I could really tell where founders were not being necessarily truthful mm. and were just kind of, you know, really trying to get us to say yes to the deal. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that is, that's what's really key. Like do your homework, yeah. but then come armed with very specific questions and really try to ask about what did that partner do when things went south? That's exactly what so, I was about to say is that I liked speaking to founders who, you know, maybe, yeah, it went south. Didn't so you back channel, out. exactly. So you also need to back channel and talk to founders that they didn't and try you too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about what it's like to now run a Series A company. So for both of you, what has been the biggest shift? I will say, so we moved our headquarters out here to San Francisco after our Series A. Okay. So you were previously we, we in... were in London and we had a New York office. And then I just decided, let's consolidate this. Like we need to all be under one roof early. That's, uh, we'll get to the distributed team phase a little later. Um, but one thing I started to prioritize was culture, really, was what are the values that this company is going to stand for and prior to raising the series a i was just heads down on revenue i was like bottom market fit revenue we've got to get these numbers and i kind of didn't really put enough time into thinking okay you know what is this culture who who are the talent that we're attracting and what are the values that they care about and i think spending the time to really come up with that so i spoke to some of my like early founding team i was like well, what are what are the values that we care about in each other? You know, why has this worked so well for the last couple of years? And we came up with those things. And then um, I was at a, like a tech recruiting day and it made me laugh at how many companies were coming up and having like acronyms for like what their values oh, yeah. were. It's like our values are cake, <laughs> community, assertion. <laughs> and I and it just made me laugh. And so I then challenged, I was like, could we come up with some you know, could we make this an acronym? And we ended up making it the Tricep Flex, which is like an old school exercise poster. And uh, it was, you know, it's, it's kind of eccentric and to definitely brings out like attributes in our character. And it's really helped with recruiting because it's given us a way to score people mm. uh, who we're bringing into the team. So I think that something I've focused on since racing is like really spending the time to think about like, what is the culture that we're, we're building? Um, yeah. I think uh, for us, really post fundraise, um, one of the things we really uh, focused on was people, and and that was building the right founding and leadership team at the company. So um, when we uh, did our Series A, uh, we were about five people full time um, at the company. Um, everyone else was part time, and um, and 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 so now by end of this year, we're going to be about twenty one people full time. Um, and and you know, so growing four X, I mean, we're still pretty small. We're mm -hmm. still um, we're still early stage. But that being said, growing four X. Is, um, is, is very difficult. And, and what, what we did was we really didn't want to compromise on the people that were coming, were, were joining the team because we know that they're going to be leading their own departments over time. So one of the things we did, um, say, you know, say it was, was someone who really was like, we, we absolutely have to make sure that we're bringing on the best people possible. So now our founding team consists of early software engineers from Nest, 
um, Google, Apple, um, Atlassian. And we've really brought people together that have this common mission, common vision, where everyone says, okay, we know um, software product management is broken. You know, the, the tooling you use today is fragmented. And at any point of time, whenever you're going through this development life cycle, you really can't understand what is really going on with whether you're starting from the initiative at the VP level, all the way down to the issues, and then even tickets that are being mm -hmm. generated um, in your existing project management software. So one of the things we really did was we tried to find our tribe. And and I think... Um, did you like write down the companies that you wanted to recruit from? And interestingly enough, um, well, besides, you know, just the adjacent, adjacent companies, 80% uh, of the companies that we ended up like in terms of like from the founding team perspective were not the companies that we had written down. Hmm. Um, and I think it's because you assume a certain, um, uh, you know, you, like, like, for example, one of the things we knew was um, CICD, like hiring from CICD tooling would be would be interesting because the messaging is very similar where they're focusing on product delivery, mm -hmm. because that's what we do, what, what, what our product does. And then we very quickly found out that um, hiring people that have been late stage at these companies is very different to really hiring people that were the first 20 in. Ha I totally and agree. And other founders in our batch who, who have closed the Series A and now building this team, it's funny how, you know, a few of us have made this textbook mistake of maybe bringing in like senior people just yeah. too early. It, and VPs, everyone makes it. Exactly. And everyone just, makes it. It's yeah. so funny because yeah. you read about it in every single book. You're like, you know, don't bring in executives too early. And, you know, you a lot of the time end up making <laughs> those mistakes. Well, I think in, the key just, yeah. is to bring in executives that have been early enough. So yes. you really, so some people say they've been early, yeah. but then when you again go down the path of questioning and it's like, no, were you really there? when it was a garage or were you really there when um like a uh, post uh, post series a and then was even the post series a considered early enough at that time so and why do we, you think it's important to like get those people who were so early i think it's because they understand the level of hustle that's required mm -hmm. Very simply yeah. that, you know, there's processes that have not been put into place that they're going to have to come in and put in the processes. I think but this, then yeah, it's also, true. by the way, but we're then about it, to have a pen wall. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. Uh, be the first time. Uh, but, but, you know, the, the other thing is that it's, it's, you know, it's, it's only very few founders that can also do this only because it means you have to be willing to give up ownership and control. Which and, is very hard to do. Yes, actually. <laughs> and and so when you're bringing in people that are much smarter than you in that area or domain, sure. and are essentially you know just um, r really understand that specific uh, specific domain, you need to be willing to take a step back, being like let them own their own their domain, let them hire their people, let them run their department. Absolutely. And so we're at that stage where we don't, I mean, everybody's in engineering, uh, right at this stage, we, we haven't started, uh, building on a sales team as of yet. Um, and, and so, but at least for these first 20 people in, we knew that this was, this is going to be the founding team. And so and each, each of these individuals will have their own departments over time. And how do you recruit from people who have offers at big companies? So it's easier said than done. Yeah. So, um, I remember, so, uh, you know, like when, when we first, uh, brought, uh, David Keith on board, who is our lead engineer. Um, he, you know, he was very intensely, like he was someone who felt very strongly about the mission and vision. And then, um, and then as we started building out the early engineering team, um, what happened was people had offers from Google, Amazon, PayPal. Um, and, and in some cases, especially when you're hiring early stage, like people that had been there early stage, what usually ends up happening is then those larger companies just give, you know, another like bonus package of let's say another 250 to 400 K in stock. And so it's, um, you really have to find people that believe in the mission and the vision and, and you as a founder have to be like, able to actually paint that picture that's what's most important yeah and i think and and, and yeah. they really like it, it needs to fundamentally come from the fact that are you building a category creating product and is uh is this something you know are you really taking on a giant incumbent and is this also a daily frustration that that person has faced so one other piece is that we were lucky as well that in the founding team that we've built every single person has faced the frustrations that we're trying to solve so that did make it easier for us i think also people need to be uh educated on what it actually means when you're a series a company because i think that 
it possibly can look that you're further along than yeah. you are. Yes. Like Series A is still so early. early. And yep. yeah, you have product market fit, but it's still a little chaotic and scrappy and things are going to change. Yeah, and, and, you know, and product market fit is a stepladder. So you're going to have it for a little bit and then you're going to suddenly lose it and then you have to change your product again. And so that's really how it is. Yeah. And and I think um, one of the, you know, one of the things it's, it's really important to understand and even as a, so one of the things I had to grapple and come to terms with was... Um, uh, like I, I had a lot of growing up to do personally as well, like yeah, post post. And again, I know this is, we're still early stage, but even then as a founder, I think for me, um, like board meetings were just this giant thing that, you know, you see and you hear and you talk about, but we had never, I had never like sure. conducted a board meeting. So, uh, conducting my first board meeting was, uh, was definitely a task and an experience on its own. And I think, you know, um, I like, I can't wait until YC has like a dedicated part of the series A program where you specifically teach because, uh, closing the A is just the first part of the, of the ball game. Um, and I think even learning how to, uh, run and conduct productive board meetings was, was um was something I, I only learned over time. Like uh, like our first one was We just had uh, our we just had our first one and I, you know, I did a bit of prep. I I think I, I sent out a board memo before, you know, it should have been a week before. It was like midnight. Uh <laughs> I was like enjoy <laughs> reading this in two hours. <laughs> uh and then, you know, I think it's so helpful to, for it to be a discussion. And yes, we're giving an update on, you know, performance and where things are going, but it's equally an amazing opportunity for you to leverage the insight of your board members to discuss what you should be focusing on and uh you know it's it doesn't ha you don't have to be an expert in in round one and everybody knows that so i actually didn't put a ton of time into, <laughs> into learning about this i was like you know what learn from experience i'll like ask if you found us how I should run my board meeting and like just dive in. And then I asked for feedback afterwards. I was like, how could I have made this better? They're like, well, you maybe could have sent the board member like a week before. I was like, yeah. good point. Two days is usually typical. Two days okay, is a good two amount days? of time. Yeah, okay. yeah, you don't have to do it a week before. Two days is usually yeah. good. So we have so we do board meetings every eight weeks. Mm. And um, it's- Every eight weeks? Yes, every okay. eight weeks. So, so it- Wow. It's, uh, it's, it's definitely, I would say it's a significant undertaking, but that being said, it enables a forcing function. Oh, so, it's so good. And also, I think going back to the whole earnings call thing was yeah. really, that was actually the only prep that I really focused mm. in on was, okay, how are these people running their earnings calls? Mm -hmm. Because if I, if I can take learnings from this and I can probably run a right. relatively successful first board meeting. Right. But also, I shared my board deck with the team. So they felt yep. buy-in or, mm -hmm. you know, what we're doing and, and kind of in the loop just to build that, again, like transparent candid culture of this is what the feedback was um how how did you how do you follow up with the so um one of the things that um that now happens um at, at, at least for the last two board meetings that we've had um our leadership team kind of comes together and they have their own domain areas and so um for example at our last board meeting um we had our our team leads present uh, as part of the board meeting as well. Oh, and yes, they, they I, yes, I, about, I also did that. Yeah. Forgot. And, yeah, and so, and idea. so they, they, you know, they kind of talked about, um, what areas they were, they were owning, but then also what are, what are the, uh, OKRs that we're aiming for for the quarter and then how those OKRs translate into monthly milestones. Um, and we actually just, so one of the things we did post series A was we instituted OKRs for the first time. And, um, and I think, you know, it's, um, it, what are it, the top three takeaways from that? Top three. Okay. Number one is don't make your OKRs too vague. Number two, ensure they're measurable. Um, they, they, it needs to be a certain number that you can hang your hat on mm -hmm. and be like, okay, did we meet this? Yes or no. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that's a, that's a function of you can even put it as a person. And then you can also put it as a percentage mm -hmm. in some cases, but I always like the yes or no. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then number three is ensure that there is team buy-in. So you, so one of the, one of the most important things I believe is that the team needs to come up, uh, with the OKRs together. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we as team leads, we get together and we, uh, really define like what is, uh, what's important for us for the quarter and then what are the monthly milestones that we want to set. I think the other piece is, um, you know, it, it, I think one piece of advice I would also give to Series A companies is initially, you know, I, I thought a lot about how often we should have our board meetings. So the typical cadence is usually quarterly. But I think that, you know, if you want to continue being at the same pace that you've been uh, working at in terms of um, from a uh, from a, a work from, from from a workload standpoint, I think having them more often is is better than having them less often. I actually disagree with this statement. Dun, uh, uh, dun, dun, dun. Oh, there we go. I, I think <laughs> that uh, 
we have our cadence currently is twice a year but i'll probably raise another round before we (laughs) you know continue with that so we've had one and then we're having another one in march however i am in on our monthly updates like i'm like doing our monthly investor updates like i have calls but i guess my concern with having them too often is i don't want to spend all of my time and i'm sure you are not doing this and i need to quiz you on how you are being optimized about it but i don't want to spend too much my time preparing a board deck like i want to execute take your all hands updates and have them in your in your board so that's so that's the thing because we do weekly all hands and yes we're also doing monthly investor updates as well in terms of calls but the the easiest way to do this is to literally take a lot of the par- components and pieces of the all hands update and translate it into uh into the board deck so that you're not spending a significant amount of time building mm-hmm. building the deck and once you have once you've done your first board meeting you have the format and template down then it just gets easier to build the next one anyway yeah. and um and i think you know for the most part um what what we optimize our board meetings for and i mean you know i, I think uh, um and, and i think we'll only improve over time is to really enable decision making and so if there's um any kind of uh, specific decision that we'd want to talk through um or have uh, working sessions on specific areas that we need to delve deeper into that's really what we're using the yeah time for. i think sequoia has a great post on this as well just how to effectively yeah. run a there's a lot on that yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, okay. So just to wrap this up, last question for founders raising their seed or series A, what would be the single most important thing you you would tell them? Focus on the partner. So really focus on the person that you're going to be working with because, uh, I mean, I used to laugh when people would tell me it's a marriage and, uh, and it's, it's really, that is absolutely true. Um, so really focus on and finding out everything you possibly can about that individual. Um, and, and, you know, don't just read press to, to, or, or read the Forbes Midas list, um, you know, to like figure out how many times they've been on the Midas list before. Yeah. I think, I think go a step further and really, uh, really do your reference checking, your, your back channeling on the specific partner because, um, you know, because at the end of the day, uh, it may be that the, the, the fund is choosing you, but you're choosing the fund and you're choosing the partner. And it's, it's really not about the fund. It's about the person. So I think single handedly, that's the most important thing you can do. I would say two things. One, have a process, get an Excel, get it color coded, know where everybody is in your funnel at any one time and just lock in on that process, funnel sheet, update it, get organized with it. And then two, I would say is to do this executive coaching session or do whatever you need to do to make you feel confident and invincible and have high conviction because it's not going to be nice, you know? It's going to be hard and you need to persevere and just remember there's always going to be a yes out there. And it may take you 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Like there was, you know, there's definitely people on about that took even longer than that, but they still got great deals at the end. And don't judge yourself by your peers. Just keep persevering with it because somebody will say yes and somebody will find the resonance in what you're doing. And just you got to keep that in a belief. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Great being here. Uh,